The following teaching is possible thanks to the friends and partners of Spirit and Truth Fellowship International. You know, I've showed in other videos that the Bible is very affirming of the death penalty. That the death penalty is the way to affirm the value of life and have a safe society. And, and that's why God commands us in the Bible in many verses that we're supposed to have a death penalty. But there's some questions that it's valuable to answer. One of them, people say to me, well, John, wouldn't thousands of people be put to death then? <laughs> Thankfully, the answer is no. And how do we know that? Because there's countries, one of them, for example, is Singapore, that has the death penalty and uses it. And everybody wakes up and goes, oh, if I do that, I'm going to be killed. And then they don't commit those crimes. And so countries like Singapore have a very low crime rate and a very safe society because that they're willing to do what the Bible says, even though they're not a Christian nation. And I contend that the United States would be in the same place. We could have a safe society with a low crime rate if we would do what the Bible says to do. Then people say to me, John, but wouldn't many innocent people be executed because they're innocent people in, on death row and innocent people that are incarcerated today? One of the reasons that there are so many innocent people that have been charged with crimes is because we don't do what the Bible says to do about perjury. If you think about it, why are there so many innocent people in the, the prisons? It, it, or if there are, I mean, you know, sometimes we don't know, but every once in a while people get out. Why are those people there? In almost every case, someone has lied about them in court. And when you look at the, the penalties for perjury, there's almost no penalty for perjury in America today. You know, even in a capital case, you just get your hands slapped. Here's what the Bible says to do. Deuteronomy chapter 19, starting in verse 16. If a malicious witness takes the stand to accuse a man of a crime, then the verses go on. It says, the priests and the judges who are in office at the time must make a thorough investigation. And if the witness proves to be a liar, giving false testimony against his brother, then do to him as he intended to do to his brother. You must purge the evil from among you. That's what the Bible says to do to perjury. And people say, oh my, I'm, oh my goodness, that means if you, were, if you perjured in a capital case, you'd be taken out and executed. Yes, you would. And you know what? Eventually, perjury in capital cases, and rape cases, things like that, it would come to an end. And all of a sudden, this, the, the potential of having all these innocent people in prison or put to death would go away. Because you don't, if you don't have people lying in court, you don't have a lot of innocent people in prison. But you see, if we're not going to be willing to do what the Bible said, oh, no, no, we, we, we couldn't possibly put somebody, if all they did was lie on the stand, we couldn't possibly put them to death. Their lie was going to cost some person his life. Again, this is God who gave these rules, and we should obey them. Somebody says to me, but John, haven't we shown the death penalty is, is not an effective deterrent to crime? I, I, that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, frankly. I mean, first of all, what do we know? Prisons? We know that more than 40% of the people who get out of prison, listen to this, this is this year's statistics, more than 40% of the people who get out of prison are back in prison within three short years. So first of all, if you have a death penalty, you stop the revolving door of a lot of those problems. Secondly, we don't carry out the death penalty biblically. Here's what the Bible says, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11. When a sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, the hearts of the people are filled with schemes to do wrong. Do we obey this verse? Do we put people who are, are, are criminals and they're convicted of a capital crime, do we put them to death quickly? No, we don't obey this verse. 15 years, 19 years, 20 years. It takes 
ages to put somebody to death. And what does the Bible say? If you have that long a time between the conviction and the execution, the Bible says the hearts of the people are filled with schemes to do wrong. So when people come to me and say, John, but the death penalty has been shown to be not effective. I say, no, the Bible has been shown to be true. The, the fact that we wait 15 to 20 years before putting somebody to death and we have other problems shows me that what the Bible says is true. If we'd have a death penalty the way the Bible says they have it, then we'd get the results that the Bible says we would get. Somebody else comes to me and says, well, but, but John, doesn't the Bible say don't judge or you'll be judged? <clears throat> yes, it does. <clears throat> In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, do not judge or you too will be judged. But what's the context? <laughs> the context was making evil judgments. And Christ said in verse 5, he said, You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the plank from your brother's eye. So, yeah, Christ said not to judge. He said, don't make evil judgments. You know what else Christ said? He said, make good judgments. Sure, Wait, Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 was don't judge or you'll be judged, but John chapter 7 verse 24 Jesus was reproving his disciples for, for the way they were behaving. And he said, do not judge by appearances. Judge with a right judgment. So Christ tells us, we've got to make judgments. They need to be right. And when they're about people's lives, they need to be especially right. And of course, there's a verse where somebody says, but John, isn't the teaching of the New Testament that we're supposed to turn the other cheek? Again, you and I need to understand the Bible. I mean, we can't just quote the Bible and assume things. Let's learn something about the Bible. Yes, the Bible does say turn the other cheek. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. Luke 6.29. What's it about? In the biblical culture, striking someone on the cheek was an insult. So Lamentations 3.30, let him offer his cheek to the one who would strike him and let him be filled with disgrace. Job 16.10, you remember Job. Job was a man who, who got sick and he lost his children and his possessions and he was ridiculed and mocked. And, and he says in 16.10, men open their mouths to jeer at me, they strike my cheek in scorn. So Christ said, if someone strikes you on the cheek, if someone insults you, Turn to him the other also. Don't let somebody's insult derail your whole life, says Jesus. It's like today. You're walking down the street and somebody calls you a name. What are you, you going to run across the street, get in a fist fight, get thrown in jail, get your whole life derailed because somebody called you a name? You know, that's what Christ is saying. Don't let anybody really derail your life with an insult. But Christ didn't say, if somebody murders your wife, marry again so he can murder the other one. You know, turn the other cheek is not about capital crimes. It's not about crime at all. What about draw the sword? You know, on the night of his arrest, Peter, Jesus' disciple, took a sword and, and struck Malchus, the high priest. And Christ said, uh, you know, put your sword back. All who draw the sword will die by the sword. What's the context of that? Well, the context of that. As much as we know the high priests were evil and were scheming, the fact of the matter is they had a legal arrest warrant for Jesus and they were carrying out that arrest warrant and Peter drew his sword and, and struck at the, at the force that was coming to arrest Christ. You know, there's that, that kind of thing could happen a lot in America today. There's lots of people who are falsely accused and the police show up at their door to arrest them. You know, what would happen if you know you're being falsely accused, the police are coming to your door, and, and you go get your rifle and you start shooting the policeman? Yes, you'd die by the sword. And what's Christ say? He says, look, in that, in that situation, don't draw the sword. But if we study our biblical history, that very afternoon, remember Christ was arrested at night. That very afternoon, Christ knew he was going to be arrested. He knew he was going to die. He knew things were going to get dicey. So you know what he said? Sure, check it out. 
Luke chapter 22, verse 36, the same day he said, if you draw the sword, you'll die by the sword. He said, now, if you have a purse, take it in a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your coat and buy one. Now, why would Christ say, sell your coat and buy a sword if you, if you couldn't use it? It doesn't make any sense. The context of the quote, if you draw the sword, you'll die by the sword, is if you draw the sword against the legal authorities, it won't go well with you. And then people will tell me, you know, well, John, but bottom line, I, the death penalty can't be loving. And I turn that right upside down. And I say, absolutely, it's loving. The Bible says that, in fact, Jesus Christ himself said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And we saw that the death penalty is commanded by God and it's commanded by God to keep our society safe. And if we love him, we will obey him. I want a safe society. I hope you do too. God in his word tells us how to get one. Let's be brave enough and bold enough to, to make sure that we can have that in society today. Our friends, our neighbors, our family, our children deserve that safe society.